Some drink grappa in old Trieste. Some publish novels with a vanity press. But I love noodles. Some name their country homes La Belle Belle Rive. Some name their yachts Oh Big Mighty Steve. But I love noodles. Some like the taste of mackerel in a can. Some can't write essays without quoting Lacan. But I love noodles. Some love a poem that speaks of rare flowers. Some wake up and say, oh my God, got a shower. But I love noodles. My name's Dave McGimsey. I love noodles. And it's great to see you all here in Ottawa. I've read at this uh, reading series for quite a long time. I think the first time I may have read here was like 1988 or something like that. You know, where I read with uh, Stephen Brockwell. And I can't even remember where it was, but I have a vague memory of it being in a church basement. I might be wrong about that, but it could very well be. But, uh, um, but it's great uh, to be here, and I've always admired uh, the uh, Ottawa literary community and the support that it gives to uh, poets, uh, not just from here, but from the rest of the country. So I'm going to read uh, poems from my recent collection called Asbestos Heights. And uh, I've been writing poetry now for more than 30 years. And that's a long time to be doing something that makes no money. That's a long time to be doing such a thing. And, uh, and all the time I've been uh, writing poetry, like uh, editors and people, and um, people in the know have always come up to me and they've always said like, uh, uh, Dave, uh, have you ever even tried like to write poems that don't reference Steve Urkel and how he turns into Stefan Urkel? Have you even tried this? You know, and I realized, well, no, I, I haven't really tried this. So this book is like the effort of this book is finally, after all this time, I'm going to write about the serious things that poets are supposed to write about. I write about flowers and trees and sexy trees and our prime ministers, our sexy prime ministers and all the important things of real poetry. So the book is in sections about these very serious uh, poetic matters. And so the first section is about flowers. And uh, I'm going to read just a few of the poems about flowers to start out with. And the first flower I write about is lettuce. <laughs> For poetry's sake, let us consider iceberg lettuce a flower. Much as I considered for poetry's sake, college, a place where I would find value in life. I can't say whether or not my whole year was good for bouquets of iceberg lettuce, blooming in beds of bacon and mayonnaise, just that I remember their quiet, cold heads. Stamen anther filament. I clammed up for most of the summer. It wasn't so bad. I missed the old provocations of rage, moved on, and didn't gain too much weight. Imagine the bride is holding her lettuce, and then tosses it to the eager crowd. For poetry's sake, I really have to say, I'm happy for her, among the crispy petals. This, the flower that this poem is based upon are, are uh, blackberries. Eventually, my literary critique was refined to, I hope all you sickening snobs just die. <laughs> I ate blackberries every morning, once, and held on to my earned mature insight. What people generally liked about me was the thought that they could do my job. The quality my friends loved most was that I was a generous tipper. I read on some website that blackberries were good for the lungs. I knew they tasted really weird. Fruits that taste good have soda pops based on them. Isn't that right, Diet Sierra Kiwi Mist? Did I mention all the blackberry smoothies 
and drinking them in one gulp, imagining I was steadying myself on Jesus' shoulder. Jesus, of course, would just have Diet Sprite. This is Queen Anne's Lace. My therapist looked over her glasses. I hate it when you say that nobody cares if you live or die. When I, for one, am quite excited by the idea of you dying. <laughs> I stared at her desk bouquet of Queen Anne's Lace wondering when we would talk about drinking. How happy I was to know I'd just leave there and go to my pub and tell jokes to old cake face. <laughs> I told her about the walks to the mall, how happy I was to just sit and read, except reading Frank Norris, of course. I mean, who the hell could be happy then? Why are you telling me this, she said, tacking back to more analytical words. No matter how devoted to my job, I would never read one of your books. <laughs> Basil. The discovery of Basil and the Basil plant was actually not made by British actor Basil Rathbone. But from an ordinary guy from Boston who was just still Basil from the block. It was, as they say in the plant birth biz, licorice -y. Not really your kind of thing. You confessed after saying, I made up all that stuff about humans needing affection. You can't hate someone for saying, we were together for a long time, but were we, like, ever really together? But it sure helps you appreciate arena football. I learned to hate Basil. Called it butt fool. Delaware parsley. Poor man's tobacco while I sat weeping in old navy pants. Oh, it's so hard to hate wearing old navy pants. The second section of this book is a collection of poems about baseball. And uh, the poems are seen through the lens as it goes through historically, it's a chronological history of baseball, but each uh, part of baseball is seen through the lens of a famous American writer. And I'm just going to read a couple from this section, and this one is called Herman Melville. The greatest baseball novel is Moby Dick. Not because Captain Ahab reminds me of Gene Mock, but because Starbucks perfect for all Kevin Costner moralisms. The new Bedford Nines race for the pennant. The boys of the whale killing summer. The big game and stabbing an albino whale right in its fucking stupid whaley eye. Baseball novels usually start with objection. I found myself riding the Pequod's pines. And through body comedy, find victory or loss. Funny, but is it writing? Given the ivory tower's ivoriness and its persistent monocle-related injuries, it's easy to understand hostility to Herman Babe Melville. This is Thomas Pynchon. Loving something that doesn't love you back is the beginning of your relationship with God. <laughs> Learning to love baseball is fun. Bud Light Funbo fun. Swatted Balls Funzo fun. 
It was like a Bible camp punishment to talk of Thomas Pynchon in grad school. Pynchon's heat death, they said, awaited me if I kept continuing to eat Expo Getty. The noise, the noise of the world was too much for them. As if ivory snope, soap, porky pig cartoons, supermarket booze, and Perry Mason could drown out their poems about Nixon. I missed the expos when I had a school reading. Oh God, my creative writing professor introduced me saying, look how lean my words were compared to how fat my body. <laughs> now I'm going to read sections uh, from, uh, which is about the history of Canada. A history of Canada, its poetry, its birds, its prime ministers, and its trees. <laughs> the title of this poem is Switching Back and Forth Between Academic and Literary Publishing Will Be As Easy as Dancing on the Hood of a Car, or so it says in the latest Quarterly Review of White Snake Videos. <laughs> I'm not afraid of coast-to-coast -coast flights. The app that converts Pacific time for West Coast residents automatically converts Kafka quotes to lyrics by the Eagles. <laughs> you, can, you can be justly proud of your thoughts on Ezra Pound, but a working scholar learns to respect TLC for not recording these days, gotta say, I'd totally settle for a scrub. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen's hit song, Millionaire Onion, may not be Bruce Springsteen's greatest song, but it's definitely his best song about an onion who is also a millionaire. <laughs> the millionaire onion came to town. The millionaire onion Close the factories down. <laughs> if you ever looked at your professor's clothes and said, this is the life for me, <laughs> then yeah, zero sympathy. <laughs> this poem is called, As Vast as the Vast Lands of This Vast Land, Poet, are you to yonder skies, breads, and local cheeses? <laughs> I'm grateful for libraries, iPad. And poetry, iPad. <laughs> Lorca's line, La Cluny del Bello Jorge Segue, is where George Clooney got his stage name. <laughs> Many tried to be the Lorca of Canada but stopped when being the Octavio Paz of Sault Ste. Marie proved sufficient. <laughs> Entre la tardi timbits y la noche. <laughs> Life in Canada is just bear attack after bear attack. It always happens. It's as incalculable as the number of times Irving Layton used the word loins. <laughs> In the animal kingdom, no creature kills for sport except the otter. In the plant world, there are few things as objectionable as balsam fir. This is a very topical poem, I'm proud to say. You know, it's keeping in the news, this one. And the title of this poem is... Uh, we should all thank Taylor Swift for taking on what poets so often vaingloriously try and fail to express, and how she, rather than being intimidated by such endeavor, gives appropriate expression to the most motivating human sentiment and puts it all into catchy, heartfelt songs. <laughs> Did everybody get that? You got that? You want to, you want to, okay. 
The title of this poem is, We Should All Thank Taylor Swift for taking on what poets so often vaingloriously try and fail to express, and how she, rather than being intimidated by such endeavor, gives appropriate expression to the most motivating human sentiments and puts it all into catchy, heartfelt songs. <laughs> okay. If I was to wear your little red square, it would be to commemorate the death of a dear friend. And if that friend's name was Redinger La Rouge Crimson Force, if I were to express my best days with you, of course I'd mention the shrimp croquettes. But I'd earn my poet's pay in images of a hurt man trying to talk to a truck. If I were to go back in time, it would be just before whoever wrote, if I could turn back time for share. But I would still come back with a poem much like this. If I were to sleep all day, I'd give it all to you, and you'd get remarried, remarried, just like you used to do. Just like you used to chew licorice red, Mon petit square head. This is like a bit of advice, you know, of, about writing and how often you should publish. And the title of this poem is, I was always told a good Canadian poet should only publish once a year, on the Queen's birthday and on the subject of the Queen's birthday. <laughs> A government program seeks to leave poems in hospital waiting rooms so patients might read them and begin to understand there are worse things than diabetes. <laughs> when Seamus Heaney passed away, he took his seven secret words that rhyme with horse to the grave with him. Our rented horse-drawn hearse just clopped away, Canadian clop après clop. Editions of Gwendolyn McEwen, where the word love is purposely crossed out and replaced with the word Kahlua, <laughs> are those still considered erasures? Show, don't tell. Show everyone in Mimico the kind of mustard-colored activewear one only sees in the best golf magazines. The kind they used to have in waiting rooms. This is called, Do You Like It When I Call You Snoodlepuss? Snoodlepuss. I'm going to pretend the poem you wrote about me was in French. And when you wrote, the soul of an egg salad sandwich bought from the Pentagon's automat, that that was about falling asleep on my shoulder. <laughs> I'm going to look a series of websites in the eye and tell them I won't back down. And I will, by nighttime, start typing up the story that puts the pro in protagonist. I was aware of all your peculiar ailments canopy rash, top hat dropsy, turtle soup intolerance, limousine anxiety. It's amazing you survived. I wanted to talk to you about your silk allergies to see if you were coping and to see if you still wrote poems about Bigfoot and if that Bigfoot still had an Irish name. This is a poem about how you make, uh, make a living as a poet. And uh, this poem is called, Every Time a Poet is Denied a Council Grant, a Blind Child is Given Back the Power of Sight. <laughs> Seems a shame I spent about seven years saying things that were not dissimilar to what Beyonce says in Halo. <laughs> except without the beauty of Beyonce's words. When I failed, my mother liked to say, 
you're all the man you ever will be. Meaning, you can't just wait to get better. Don't just lie there in a ditch you dug. But I couldn't keep my story straight. Did I walk out from a fiery plane crash? Was it cool being ambassador to Spain? Did Philip Larkin really call me dude bro? I won't say I found a hole so dark I understood it as an abscess of hell. I'll just say I started watching Frasier. I'll just say every single episode. <laughs> poem is called Ornithologists Believe the Laughing Seagull is Laughing at Blackbirds because of that stupid Beatles song about them. <laughs> when I turn and say I hate the Beatles, don't get me wrong, I don't mean it that way. I just mean that I hate their horrible music. <laughs> That's it, just their horrible music. But when I think of the Beatles' hit songs from Oopy Doopy Bee to Oh Deirdre, Mrs. Medwin's Sunday Chutney, Step Right Up Sydney Dear, I wince. Not because their songs are poorly written or performed in an inadequate fashion. For a group so drug addled they could not perform live, the Beatles sure made hit records. It just makes me wince, but maybe that's me. I've seen people singing classic Beatles songs from Hey Moon Cat to Love is So Lovely. And they all seem perfectly happy to me. By the end of the collection, the Poems are more lyric poems, and uh, I'm just going to read a few more and finish off. And this poem is called, uh, Unfuckable is the New 30. <laughs> Cone flowers like a dirty taffeta, purple daisies like dirt, dirty knobs of flocks, dirt fuck hollyhocks, scarred up and dead sauced, stuck in an apartment in a heat wave. What, dear flower, was poetry good for, besides putting the capitalist force of college diplomas into the phrase, if you don't love me, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> the wise take being unloved as given, saying, smell the hyssop syrup or some such, whipping biscuits off hotel rooftops, hollering, hyacinth symbolize baseball, primrose like something prim, the way a smudge of color is as good as it will get, the way one hands out rue like sunscreen, because it's going to be one of those Sundays. It's a song lyric about the most important uh, piece of anybody's wardrobe. And this uh, poem, this uh, lyric is called Beautiful Fat Pants. <laughs> Beautiful Fat Pants, today is our day. No pretending to read I, Seamus Heaney. No Skyping with pretendfriend.com. Beautiful Fat Pants. Beautiful fat pants. Beautiful fat pants, you remember me. The reruns of Moesha, the noodle soups, the new poetry of Suzanne McNews. Beautiful fat pants. Beautiful fat pants. Beautiful fat pants never killed a goose. Steel Smith for all absent mind township. Shepherd through the purply valley of chafe. Beautiful fat pants. Beautiful fat pants.
beautiful fat pants today will be smooth. The indoors bulge with internet quilting. Desktop flowers made of Twitter barbs. Beautiful fat pants. Beautiful fat pants. This poem is called, Our Parnassus Will Go On. Shout out to Celine Dion. Yeah. The great poets are always decisive. When Sylvia Plath went for chicken wings, she never had to think twice about whether to order them mild, hot, or suicide. <laughs> when Edward Ted Hughes would buy summer shorts, he could hear the hair on his legs touch, and the hairs would sing mbop in Welsh. <laughs> Such are the legs of Legsy the poet. But hey, leg up when the editor lags. We're not looking for work, we're looking for content. Just a thing that frames pictures of Yado, a thing that says, I don't rent tuxedos. When the great poets think upon the sun, they must surely think of Mr. Drummond, dropping to one knee, outstretching his arms, as if anything were possible with love. And I'll finish off uh, with this poem. Uh, in all actuality, I wrote this uh, whole book for my dad, because uh, my dad was a great gardener, taught me a lot about like cultivating flowers, was an incredible baseball fan, lifelong uh, New York Yankees fan, you know, and a sort of a proud uh, citizen of uh, Ville d'Anjou, Quebec, you know, where we, uh, where we grew up. And in all seriousness, this book is just a book of poems that, you know, are com to commemorate uh, the influence and uh, the love I have for uh, my dad. And I'll finish off with a poem for my dad, which is called Schoolhouse Lilies. Except when he was watching baseball, it seemed my father was always outdoors, tipping his hat to locals, watering the flowers that focused his retirement. A Yankees fan for over 90 years, in mid-September, a week before he died, my father said of the retiring Derek Jeter, he's too old to play short. They need home runs. My father grew rows of spider flowers, but he called them by their French name, Cleom. The Cleom were gone by mid-October, and the Yankees didn't make the playoffs. Some call oxblood lilies schoolhouse lilies, because when they bloom, it's time to go back. It's good to have a job, my father told me as I complained about ever returning. Thank you everyone for uh, being here. It's a great pleasure to read to you. Thank you, Tree, thanks.